Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2023 of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. I remind all members and witnesses to ensure that their devices are on silent and all other notifications are turned off. The first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to take item four in private. Are members agreed? agreed. We're all agreed. Thank you. The next item on our agenda today is to take evidence as part of our pre-budget scrutiny. But before we do that, I'd like to invite Marie McNair to make a declaration of interest. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'd just like to bring members' attention to, uh, to my register of interest that I was a councillor on Western Barnsley Council up until May 2022. Thanks very much. And we are joined this morning uh, for the session by Jo Fitzpatrick, who is the Minister for Local Government Empowerment and Planning at the Scottish Government. And Mr Fitzpatrick is joined by the Scottish Government officials Hannah Keats, who is the unit head at Local Government Policy and Relationships Unit, and Ian Storey, who is the head of Local Government Finance. We're also joined by Councillor Katie Hagman, who is the resource spokesperson from COSLA, and Ca Councillor Hagman is joined by Simon Cameron, who is the Chief Officer of Workforce and Corporate, and Corporate Policy at uh, COSLA. And I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. I now invite Mr Fitzpatrick and Councillor Hagman to make short opening statements. Mr Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Convener. And I want to thank the committee for the invitation to participate in this uh, pre-budget scrutiny session today. Particularly grateful that in inviting both Councillor Hagman and myself, the committee has recognised the importance of involving both local and national government in these pre-budget discussions in line with our Verity House uh, agreement commitment. The Scottish Government recognises that local government workforce planning is a matter for each individual local authority. While some issues are experienced Scotland-wide, each Council also faces its own unique set of challenges requiring tailored solutions rather than homogenous approaches alone. That said, we are aware of the significant impact that workforce shortages in particular areas such as environmental health and planning services is continuing to have across Scotland. These shortages undoubtedly impact upon our ability to achieve our three shared priorities. The Scottish Government is therefore fully committed to working in partnership with local government to ensure that the new deal with local government affords the greatest level of flexibility to councils to tackle workforce challenges in ways that work for them. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Councillor Hagman. Thank you for, for inviting us along to the to the pre-parliamentary, pre-budget scrutiny. I think it's really important that we are able to come and speak to you today and certainly I welcome the opportunity. I would echo the, the words of the Minister there that you know, we have an opportunity through the Verity House Agreement and our shared priorities, those being specifically tackling poverty, but importantly net zero and also the sustainability of our services, which are absolutely crucial going forward. Clearly there's challenges throughout local government and also with Scottish Government and with that clear focus that these are outcomes that we're working towards, then obviously we, we want to be able to make sure that we're providing for all our communities right across Scotland, recognising that we have 32 local authorities who will by default do things separately and differently to meet the needs of their own communities as they see fit. So thanks for the opportunity today. Thank you very much um, to both of you for those opening statements. I will uh, open with a, a general question, um, which is I'd be interested to hear what you see as the main challenge that local, the local government workforce is facing. And maybe if I could address that initially to Councillor Hagman. Checking. Do you, need you, you don't need to do I that. I don't need Sorry. to do that. I should have okay. told you that. Yeah, no. we'll do it all for you. No, you no need to worry about technical stuff. That's fine. Um, so, I mean, clearly one of the, the main topics is our budgets. And, um, you know, we do absolutely need to be planning for the future. Um, you know, there's issues raised around multi-year settlements, etc. But that's, and, you know, we do have an aspiration, absolutely, that we would want to see multi-year settlements. That, that has been a long-standing position of COSLA. That's not to say that our local governments aren't planning already. Clearly, we have to. You know, we've got key responsibilities and we are making those, those planning assumptions into the future. But with the certainty of multi-year multi settlements, that makes that, that journey an, an awful lot easier. 
We have issues around recruitment, which are well recognised. I think the, the, one of the most pertinent is around planners. Um, you know, we acknowledge that you know, looking, I think, the data ahead over the next 10 years, we're expected to need around about 700 new planners coming into the system. Now, there's only one university in the whole of Scotland that offers an undergraduate degree in planning. And the, there was previously a master's, I believe, at Heriot Watt, but that is no longer in place. So there is nowhere in Scotland that planners can have that real deep dive, that expertise that having a master's degree offers. And, you know, that is a, a clear concern for local government. So that's just one aspect. We have, you know, issues around social work and we, we value all of our workforce. I think it's really important to stress that point that there's no one aspect of our workforce that stands alone and by its very nature local government is encompassing those whole raft of professionals. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of a flavour of where we're at. Thank you very much, and, and I, I think we appreciate you highlighting the issue with the planners because that's something we're certainly aware of. Um, Minister. I think um, Councillor Hagman has covered um, some of the main areas. Obviously, a, a, a couple of areas that she flagged are areas that we would be hopeful to make progress on. So multi-year funding um, is, is absolutely um, an, an aspiration. It continues to be an asp aspiration. Um, and... But there is the challenge that we have in terms of our, the settlement the Scottish Government gets um, from the UK Government. That said, the medium-term financial strategy includes an increase in local government funding uh, in cash terms of £1.5 billion from this year to 2027-28. So there's a, a degree of certainty of where the Scottish Government wants to go to help local government plan, but obviously... We, we have the challenge that we receive our settlement in terms of the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament um, on an annual basis and, and um, that has to interface in that in terms of the real world when we all have that difficult challenge of setting the budget for, for, for Scotland. Thanks for that, those responses. Um, well, obviously, the new deal with local government is reflected in the fact that you're both here today, and I think, Minister, you said that in your, in your opening statement. I'd be interested to hear... Um, what you think the key ways are in which this new deal can support local authorities in address addressing the workforce challenges. And maybe again, I'll start with Councillor Hagman. Thank you. I think, I mean, it is, it is vital that we concentrate on what are the outcomes we are looking to achieve. And certainly I've already seen evidence that through the Verity House Agreement, there's a lot there's a collaboration. Now, I've been in this post just over a year, and when I came in, um, obviously, it was a steep learning curve for me, but I've been really heartened in the last six months of the work, and there has been a huge amount of work to, to have all 32 local authority leaders sign up to, to this agreement. I think going forward, it's absolutely vital that we have eyes on the, the new fiscal framework. That is going to be vital, and while... I appreciate we want to look at our workforce. So much of this does come down to finances and the challenges we're facing. The, the fiscal framework is an aspiration. There's ongoing work with that. It's not going to be a quick fix that we can, we can um, find solutions to every issue. And I think there's wide acceptance of that. But together, as with that commitment, which we have, and as I say, which is signed up cross-party to ensure that we find a better way of working, there's real opportunities. And I, I've seen that already just with the, the cross-working between my officials in local government and officials in Scottish government. So there's real opportunities. We need to not lose focus, though, on what those outcomes are. And just finally, clear, in the um, programme for government, there was a clear point on poverty being, being an issue. Now, clearly, that's one of the strands of the Verity House Agreement. And I was really heartened to be invited into roundtable dialogue with the Deputy First Minister, but then also with a separate roundtable dialogue with the Cabinet Secretary for Education. So again, that's putting into practice what we've signed up, because clearly we can sign all the pieces of paper we want, but unless we follow through and we have that clear, open dialogue between Scottish Government and local government, it's not going to go forward. And there's a real, there's a real desire to make this work and deliver, as I say, for, for all of our communities. 
Thanks very much for that. It's quite heartening to hear the the um, the um, work that's already being taken um, forward, uh, and it's good to hear your underscoring around the the new fiscal framework, Minister. I'd be interested to hear your reflections on the experience so far. Yeah, I think and going um, obviously I was fortunate to come in um, just that while this work was actually quite quite well progressed. There had been a lot of work had already um, taken place in terms of resetting the relationship, which is what the new deal is about. Um, I think one of the biggest things which I think Council Hagman talked about um, in, in her contribution was around building trust between COSLA and the Scottish Government. And it's a, a, that, that, that has to be a, a two-way thing, um, respecting both of our electoral man democratic electoral mandates. I think sometimes in the past we kind of forget that the other side have a mandate too. So sometimes um, maybe local government don't recognise the mandate that the Scottish um, Parliament has around for in, around some areas, um, and sometimes we kind of forget that um, our councillors were democratically elected by their electorate in their elections as well. And so that, that's, I think, one of the really important things is respecting our, our, our two mandates, respecting that both spheres of government have um, a, a mandate on in, sometimes in shared areas. So there's areas where clearly Scottish Government and local government have a mandate on and we need to build up trust in order to do what we all want to do, which is to deliver on the sh three shared priorities mm -hmm. for all of our um, citizens. I think actually that was a pretty significant um, advance that um, all six groups in COSLA, all six different political groups, the Scottish Labour, Scottish Conservatives, Scottish Liberal Independent Group, Scottish National Party, Scottish Green Group, were all able to sign up to agreeing that the three priorities of tackling poverty, particularly child poverty, transforming the economy through a just transition to net zero and delivering sustainable public services was something that they would all prioritise, um, putting party politics aside and, and recognising that these were three areas that we could work together um, across the parties and across the two spheres of, of government in Scotland. And I think that's our starting point and we're, we're developing that. We're improving trust going forward. Um, there's obviously a, a, this is a, a big change in terms of the way we've worked. Um, you know, in the past, the Scottish Parliament would pass a piece of legislation, um, ask COSLA, you know, what's this going to cost to deliver? Because you're going to be delivering it, and you get no, you get no say on it, and, and that's whether it's a government bill or a or a, a, a member's bill. Um, and 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 that was about the 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 the. the extent of, of that consultation with local government. Now, um, I hope going forward we have much more earlier um, discussion between Scottish Government and, and, and COSLA, our local government partners. But also, I think one of the things that the Parliament needs to work out and is, is how, if there's members' bills, for instance, or members' amendments, that, that across the Parliament we all respect local government's democratic mandate and, and we work out how, and this will be more difficult, actually, how... Um, um, backbench members' uh, amendments or, or members' bills um, can have that same level of collaboration with local government mm. while respecting the different democratic places that we're coming from. Thanks very much for that. And I think that, that's abs that was really on my mind. That's absolutely um, a critical point that you're making at the end there around members' bills, but also amendments to Scottish government bills that come in in the stage three. And <clears throat> has that has there been enough consultation with local government on, on that? That would be interesting to see what kind of protocol needs to be put in place to, to make sure that that's really happening appropriately. Um, look, I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, so last week we heard that the creation of a general power of component, competence for local authorities, as there is in England and Wales, would provide greater opportunities and powers to address challenges. And I'd be interested to hear if this is being considered and maybe I'll start with the minister. So, so there's um, a, a huge work, huge amount of work ongoing in terms of developing um, the fiscal framework, looking up um, where we can um, relax <clears throat> previous uh, ring fencing, looking at what further um, powers um, can can be extended to to local government. But Ian, do you want to kind of maybe say a little bit about the, the work that's going on in the background? Because it's, it's really important. The fiscal framework is really critical to making sure that the, the New Deal, Verta House is part of the New Deal. It's a really important part. It's a really good success, and it's already changing the way we were working. But getting the fiscal framework right, I think, is crucial to making it work for the long term. So we're working really hard and taking the time that it takes to get that right. And we have to get it right first time. Um, so. 
The, uh, thanks, Minister. The, I think that the, the key thing I think Councillor Hagman said is there's no quick fix in the fiscal framework, and I think we've made quite a lot of progress in, in a number of areas, and we're still making progress in other areas. We've made a lot of progress in terms of early budget engagement, earlier budget engagement, and Councillor Hagman's met DFM a couple of times as part of that. We've also made quite good progress on the processes and approaches that would need to be taken forward either by a council or all councils in terms of coming forward with proposals for revenue raising powers during those discussions we've identified that we think a general power of competence is probably not within the gift of the scottish government and perhaps not within the gift of the scottish parliament under the current devolution settlement so we're not currently working on a general power of competence but we are establishing processes and and the questions that would need to be asked if our council or councils wanted to come forward with some revenue raising opportunities and to make sure they're taken forward in partnership. And I think a key part of all of the fiscal framework, and again, this comes back to Councillor Hagman's point about no quick fix. I think everybody acknowledges we're dealing with £12 billion worth of local government money here. We need to get this absolutely right. And we need to avoid unintended consequences. And I think that's one of the things that we're looking at in terms of the powers of, of new revenue raising powers. We need to make sure that they're consistent with national policies, make sure there's not unintended consequences, not overspill effects on other councils, on other services and things like that. And that's the discussions that we're taking forward in partnership. Thanks very much. Can I just clarify something you said? Um, so the idea with the um, councils coming forward with ideas for new revenue raising powers, it, it, I think I caught that you said something about an individual council could come forward. So there's a nuanced approach to this. So if Orkney had something that was unique and nuanced to Orkney, they could come forward with that proposal. That, that's the discussions we're having at that's the moment. The we don't think that everything needs to come via COSLA. If an individual council has a proposal that works for them and doesn't work for any other councils, we don't really see why there should be any barriers to them exploring that. The processes that we're putting in place are very much best practice in terms of policy making. Why are we doing this? What are the options to achieve it? What are the consequences of this? So it's very much motherhood and apple pie, but it's seeking to establish that, that, that yes, it can be deployed should Orkney, if in that example, wish to do something that is unique to them. OK, thanks very much. Yeah, Simon. Thank you very much, Chair. And I suppose just to build on what Ian's been saying in the rest and, and where this conversation also lies is very much in the, the local governance review. And obviously, the local governance review remains a key commitment of Verity House. And throughout Cos's position has been a, an asymmetric approach being taken. So exactly to the point that Ian's talking about, that uh, the approaches that councils will take and, and that indeed we'll take with our public service partners. Because remember, this, this goes beyond just councils. This is about looking at how we work across the public sector and how we can uh, empower uh, all public bodies at a local level, how they can deliver and shape and use public monies at a local level in the way that best suits and meets the needs. As Verity House has rightly done, setting out three kind of key priorities. Those priorities cut across everything that we do as public service providers, uh, providers in our communities and the rest. So there are lens through which we should look at how we best operate. And I think the key kind of question we need to ask ourselves is not uh, the what we do, but how we do. That's what's fundamental at the heart of Verity. That's what strays into what the impact is for our workforces across Scotland, because clearly we've got very many different policies and strategies in place across very many different parts of the public sector. And we've got the opportunity to draw the threads together, to provide clarity to colleagues on the ground and to enable people to be empowered in the tasks that they do and share in delivering on those outcomes, both nationally, but fundamentally and critically at a local level as well. OK, thanks very much. That's very helpful. I'm going to move on and bring in Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, Minister, Councillor Hagman and, and colleagues. Um, I wonder if I could invite you to, to say a little bit more about how the, the fiscal framework will give the kind of flexibility that everyone's seeking and we're all talking about. Um, we heard from colleagues last week in the session that there's still a feeling of a lack of flexibility in how the local authorities apportion their funding to various duties. Um, could I start by asking, is, does that mean that the dreaded ring fencing is at an end and we're replacing that with this flexible arrangement that we'll collectively somehow agree to? So could I maybe start with Joe, please? So we are committed to, to reviewing all of the, the, the ring fenced funds um, over time. Um, but what, what we're saying is that going forward, there should only be ring fencing with agreement. 
Clearly, part of the, the process is to develop um, an assurance framework, um, and which is which is a different way of doing stuff. So um, we need to work together on that. We need to get that right. I mean, right now there's about seven percent of of um, investment um, is formally a ring fence, but we know that on top of that there's a significant amount of money which local authorities spend on um, statutory services, which obviously removes flexibilities, but within that there is flexibility as to how that money is, 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 is spent. But the first stage of the work that we're doing is to review all existing funds which are transferred to local government outside of the general uh, revenue and general capital grants, um, and we're looking at how, how much of that can be baselined for the 2024-25 budget. And, and obviously the outcome of that work, which is ongoing now, it's kind of part of the work that we're doing in terms of developing the fiscal framework, will be seen in, in, in the budget and when, when, when that, that is published. But there's a, a lot of work already happened, a lot of work continuing to go. But we, you know, this is not backward looking, so um, it's, it's about moving forward. The, 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 there shouldn't be ring fencing unless it's agreed. There will be times, I think, when um, Scottish Government and COSLA agree that for a particular reason, um, that there should be a ring fence fund for, for one thing in particular, probably for a short time. I think that, that would be the expectation going forward, I think, is that we wouldn't be having ring fenced money in, 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 in the long term. But you know, the, the point is it should be with agreement. That's, that's, it's great to hear that after so many years in the Parliament, listening to that argument, usually at this committee, year on year, about ring fences. So it's great to hear that this flexibility is there. C Councillor Hagman, what's your view of that, and in particularly in the workforce planning area, is the flexibility there to help the local authorities with the workforce planning issues that we face? Yeah, so I think I think what the Minister's just outlined there is absolutely correct. Verity House Agreement was signed on the 30th of June, and it, it became sort of a moment in time. And to not look back, but you know, we have to acknowledge that, yeah, clearly there is there is that seven percent that has been formally legally ring fenced, but there's still around about sixty-three percent of our budget that is is directed spend. However, that is where we have been last year. Moving forward, absolutely we, we have it's absolutely vital that we open the lines of, of dialogue. And I think in terms of planning, it's a, a really good example, which I, I know is one that's been raised previously, is around about free school entitlement. So clearly there was funding allocated and put aside for free schools. However, from a local authority point of view, we need to really acknowledge that the, the funding that it costs to deliver school meals is not just X number of children with X number of this is how much it costs, because there's clear implications for our infrastructure, for managing those expectations. And then across the workforce, we need to absolutely ensure that we've got enough, you know, and it is very pertinent today, but our catering staff, our janitorial staff, those all feed into those, those nuances and, and they're all different across 32 local authorities. You know, I, I'm aware of one, one councillor who told me that in order to deliver free school meals with their current setup in one of their high schools, they would need to start at half past nine in the morning with school lunches and they might finish by about half past four. Now, clearly, that's not acceptable. So, do you know, but that's not the case elsewhere in some of our small rural schools. We have got capacity across our dining halls and, and staff available to come in. So we really, it's about having that real open dialogue and, and going forward, absolutely, where there's new um, initiatives coming forward, there's an, that agreement to work to deliver, because we are signed up, we're absolutely signed up to these priorities. So we need to have those real honest conversations. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll go as far to say as, you know, I was... I was slightly taken aback that some of these conversations hadn't happened in the past. So let's not look back, but let's look forward to see, right, how can we do it differently? So that, again, it's, it's genuinely quite exciting to be part of this. Thanks. Mm. That's very encouraging. I wonder if I could maybe the second part of my question is about cash, hard cash on the table. Um, do the finance circular issued to the pre-budget shows a real terms increase at 1.3 per cent and 4.3 per cent over the past 10 years. You mentioned in your opening remarks, I think 1.5 billion extra in cash terms to 27, 28. 
However, our colleagues, particularly last week, continue to remind us that, that in their view, we still need about a billion pounds more to deliver the level of service that, 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 that COSLA would expect and local authorities would expect to deliver for us on our behalf. So there's quite a, quite a gap there. I'm sure you realise. Could you address that issue and give us your views about where we are in that, that long-running debate about cash on the table? So, so the, the, there's no question that in spite of the real terms increases that were allocated to local government and, and several other public services um, this year, that the pressures on our local authorities um, and other public services is unsurpassed. Uh, you know, the levels of in-year inflation have not been experienced, in, certainly in, in my, my memory, um, uh, maybe when I was very young. That these kind of levels of inflation, but um, the, the, I, so there was nothing could could plan for for that. So that pressure is there, and you know our public services have done an amazing job to manage that in a way that protects the most um, important services. Um, but you know, let's not pretend it's it, it's all apple pie. Um, it, it's it, it's it's not. It's it, it's been really challenging this year, in particular. You know, we're facing um, significant. Um, in-year increases because of inflation, because of high energy costs, higher than expected pay um, settlements. These, you know, these are this year's having to be allocated from this year's funds. So there's no question that there's a, a real challenge there, um, which is partly why we're looking at you know further flexibilities for local government. But I think one of the things we need to do is to look at how we can empower local government to to raise more of its own funds. So that's a kind of wider discussion and. Um, when I've gone around the country speaking to leaders of councils, I've been encouraging them to think about the, the thing that works for them because it's absolutely clear there's some ideas coming through in um, the parliament just now, the visitor levy, um, second properties, and, and these will work for some local authorities, but they won't work for others. And so I think we need to, to be open to the idea um, of, of listening. You know, obviously there's a working group within COSLA, which uh, Councillor Hagman um, co-chairs, um, but then there's, you know, there's 32 local authorities and there might be other ideas out there. And it might be that a local authority comes up with an idea which they think is bespoke to them, but then actually another local authority says, well, actually, that's really useful. That will be useful for us too. So I think we need to be open to that um, if we want to have the kind of public services that um, I think we all do aspire to for um, our, our public services. Thanks very much, Joe. Councillor Hagman, could I have, maybe I can invite you to offer your perspective on the cash on the table issue and yeah. is it enough... How much more do we need? How do we get there? Just to... I think I'll start by saying it's never enough. <laughs> it's never enough. Um, local government is in a incredible. It's an incredible privilege because we're right in the heart of our communities. Where I've described it before, it feels like sometimes we're literally on that front line, holding our communities, trying desperately to provide and stop people falling through the cracks, but also try and encourage people to invest and support enterprise and business and, and all these issues. It's a myriad of, of different points and not one of them are working in silo. You know, we work collectively together. Um, so in terms of cash, no, absolutely not. There's never enough. Um, but our, our workforce are on the front line of that. And you know, Again, nobody's denying that you know Scottish government and local government aren't facing huge challenges, but we desperately need to work invest in their workload. They are our, our frontline workers are key in order to deliver for our communities, but they're also key in preventative work. You know, often you know things do go wrong, and you know we, we see levels of child poverty. We see the gaps between those that have and those do not. We see that you know getting ever increasingly difficult. We're seeing more strains on our health service, for example, and local government has a real opportunity to. to dive in at an earlier stage to prevent many of the, the really hard-hitting issues and chronic situations that are developing across the community. So, you know, we need to invest in our workforce. We, we need to ensure that our workforce remains healthy and that's, you know, physically, mentally, and that they're supported. And we want to also keep them in local government. If they want to, you know, come into local government, there's real opportunities to develop careers in local government. And we want our workforce to feel valued as well. So there's, there's a huge body of work to be done. And again, I, I can't reiterate it enough, 
that element of 32 local authorities, what works in one doesn't always work across. So we need to have that, you know, almost back to that sort of power of competence of, of delivering and back to local government. So we will argue for that. But, you know, we, I think having the open dialogue at the start, and that's where we're at, so we can get very carried away if this is where we want to get to, or we can look back and see where we've been. We're here right now, and there's, this is why it, it does feel quite exciting. There's an opportunity with Scottish Government to do something a bit different and actually have those not always easy conversations, but we're having them, which is brilliant. OK, th th thank you very much for those responses, Convener. Thank you. I'll hopefully come back in. Later yep. on in the meeting. Thank Thanks you. very much, Willie. I actually got a bit of a follow-up um, to that. So, um, cash, there's never enough cash, uh, and there's this opportunity for rev revenue raising, but I think both of you earlier on pointed to um, some kind of need for certainty. And so, if we've got one-year um, one budgets, uh, annual budgets, are you, I'm interested to know if you are discussing a way to create some kind of certainty, even within that budget settlement so that councils can plan. Is that something that's come into the um, fiscal framework discussions uh, as of yet? Councillor Hagman. Yeah, I mean, so again, it's about setting that expectations. We're, we're, we're not at a point of saying this is how we're going to do it. But absolutely, I think these are all the nuances that we need to take forward into that fiscal framework. This week, we've got the COSLA convention is happening, or we've got our confidence for the first time in three years this week. And at convention, we're taking a piece on the fiscal framework because, again, it's it's great that we're having this discussion here today, but we need to have this discussion with all of our councils and all of our councillors as well, so that there is a real understanding. And, and certainly, yeah, I think absolutely going forward, that has to be part of the dialogue and form part of the framework that we're, we're developing. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Do you want to add anything? Or? Just, just that I mentioned earlier that the, you know, the medium term for <clears throat> financial strategy did include um, increases in local government funding to give a, an indication, but it is just an indication. Um, the lack of certainty around um, funding from the UK government means that the final decision ultimately will be um, in, when the Scottish government is passed. But there's a, as Councillor Hagman said, there's been a lot more earlier um, collaboration with uh, COSLA and Councillor Hagman's already had uh, meetings with Deputy First Minister, which is much earlier than would happen have happened in previous years. So that, that engagement is, is definitely front-loaded um, uh, this year. Great. Good to hear. Thank you very much. And I'd like to bring in Pam Gosal. Th thank you, Chair. Good morning, Minister, and good morning to the rest of the panel. As you probably know, today is the first day of the industrial action by the non-teaching staff. And last week, we heard that the Verity House Agreement has had very little impact at Unison Discourse with COSLA. And uh, Joanna Baxter, head of local government Unison, sort of alluded to the fact that per perhaps it's being used as a reason why one side cannot take the other. For example, COSLA can't criticise the Scottish Government by asking why it won't provide more money to fund pay deals. And similarly, the Scottish Government refuses to interfere in COSLA's relationship with trade unions. So where are the lines of accountability drawn here? And how can you guarantee there are constructive conversations that, about uh, financial resources? Could I ask Councillor Katie the, the question first, please? Yep. No, thank, thank you for, for your question. I think it needs to be really clear that the current strikes that are happening at the moment are as a result of negotiations within the, the Scottish Joint Council, the SJC, and that firmly lies with local government. Local government are the employers, and it is only local government that can go forward in the pay discussions. We have met throughout the process. Um, obviously, it's, it's not really for the committee here to start delving into those neg negotiation nuances, um, but I'm quite happy to confirm that you know, I've, I've continued to meet with our trade union colleagues and certainly met with them yesterday. And I will continue to meet with them. I've, I've been asked, have I ever not met with them at their request? That's, that's never happened. I think, to be clear, and it, again, it is a point that I've made previously, that local government finance absolutely 
our workforce is, is crucial. I've, I've stressed that point already. But we also have to have sustainability of all our services. And that's a, that's a point that's been raised by COSLA leaders. Clearly, I've got a spokesperson role, and I get my mandate from the COSLA leaders on this one. And they've been very clear that sustainability is key to our services. And absolutely, pay will form part of that. And certainly, this year, the way that the negotiations have worked out, we, we put forward a very strong offer at the start of the year. Clearly, that wasn't acceptable. We have worked collaboratively with Scottish Government to look at how that offer can be increased. And there has been additional funding put into the settlement from reprofile funding. But ultimately, this is a pay offer worth nearly half a billion pounds. It is a strong offer. I don't particularly think it's appropriate to go into the nuances as all the details. But I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on that as well. But I think there has to be a firm line. This is local government's role to negotiate. The responsibility lies with local government. It's not, with all due respect to the minister, it's not for Scottish government to dictate, because there has to be that level of respect. Otherwise, if we don't have that level of respect, we're, we, we're going to undo the potential of real positivity before we've even got out out the starting blocks on this. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Could, Chair, could I come back on that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Councillor Katie, you're absolutely right, obviously, and you're showing where the accountability lies. However, um, yes, there is a pay offer on the table, but I believe I heard, if I didn't hear right this morning, was that that pay offer, um, they're wanting certainty where that's coming from, that it's not coming from more cuts, because local government is really suffering, you know, and if you, you're right, they are the people that are delivering on the ground, but they are suffering, and if they're going to be basically cuts that they're going to take, you know, Rob P Peter to give to Paul, that's what they want to know, where the cuts are coming from. So I do think that the Scottish Government is accountable here because it comes down to the funding settlements, obviously, and where the Scottish Government can help as well. Because um, they directly, uh, yes, you, like you said, they can't step in, but it actually starts at them. So basically they can help out there. And that's where clarity is needed, that these cuts, um, if they are cuts, where are they coming from? So what's your view on that? So, again, without going into the nuances of details, I certainly heard Mr Ferguson this morning on GMS making that claim. I was also invited on to GMS and spoke just after 8 o'clock, which I confirmed at that point that letters have gone to our trade union colleagues on the 22nd of September and the 24th, so that was Friday night, and on Sunday, again, it was very clear in that letter, and I... I I gave a direct quote on, on GMS this morning. I'm happy to give the direct quote on that letter, which said, we are able to provide the reassurance that you have requested that additional resources have been identified on the basis that there is no detriment to either jobs or services, because we understand and we recognise that there is that concern, and we have repeatedly and consistently given that reassurance. I'm, I'm slightly concerned that Mr Ferguson is said in a public statement that we haven't given those concerns because those letters have gone through and we've, we, those were joint letters. There was, it would appear that there was, again, information that there was conflicting letters from Scottish Government and COSLA. Again, you know, for the record today, I think it's really important to say that actually there's been a joint approach going forward and letters that have gone out have been jointly agreed between Scottish Government and local government. So, again, I'm, I'm not sure where Mr Ferguson is getting that information from. Thank you for clarifying. Thanks. Would the Minister like to Yeah, say yeah thank, thanks very much for the opportunity. I mean, obviously, it is important to, uh, at the offset, recognise that negotiations, local government pay negotiations, are rightly between COSLA, as the representative of the employers, local government, and the trade unions representing the workforce. That, that said, the, the suggestion that you, in your original question, that the Scottish Government has um, chosen to stand back, um, I think, I, I don't know your exact words, but effectively to stand back from this is, is, is not factually correct. Going right, right back to the start, the Scottish Government provided a further £155 million in the 2023-2024 20, um, 
allocation to support meaningful um, pay rise for local government workers. So that was in addition to the, when we, we saw that inflation was rising, that was additional money after the budgets had been set. In addition to that, um, we provided reassurance that will support councils with the £94 million increased recurring costs for, for future years. That was a real concern for local authority when they made the, 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 not the last offer, the offer before. They were really concerned, not necessarily about that money, but what they do for future years. And so, unusually, and because of the Verity House the collab and the collaboration around that, um, Deputy First Minister um, was content to provide that assurance going forward, which um, I think um, group leaders ac across the local authorities um, welcomed. And I think it was unanimous, as I understand, in, in terms of, of then making that further offer. And when that offer was uh, rejected, um, there was a huge collaborative effort between COSLA and the Scottish Government to look at how additional funds could be um, identified without impacting on um, uh, jobs and services. And, and you know, there was a huge effort, Scottish Government officials, COSLA officials and local government finance officials working really hard to, to look at how they could identify um, reprofile money, um, capital to um, revenue, um, opportunities to make sure that we could reprioritise £80 million from existing spend and identify emerging underspends to enable um, that last offer that, that COSLA has made. And it, it was obviously um, good to hear that two of the, the, the unions recognised that that offer met the demands that unions had made. Um, and I, I guess we'll continue to work to try and make sure that the third union gets the clarity that they seek. But Councillor Hagman um, has identified some joint communications which you would hope would um, reach their way to, to members. Um, Ian, are, are we able to give a little bit more um, understanding of where the 80 million came from? If that, if that would be helpful, we can. So, as, as members will be aware, at this time of year, this is when ministers start to see underspends in budget lines, and that's why we have the autumn budget revision and summer budget revision processes. That, through the course of the year, spending doesn't necessarily go as planned, and that involves overspends and underspends. But in the current situation, ministers have been able to identify 22 million of capital underspend, which um, Cannot, traditionally, capital could not normally be used for pay, but as local government have more flexibilities on resource to capital switching, and some councils will be using capital f uh, resource funding to fund capital investments, this will allow them to switch that funding back out so that they can use capital for the capital investment and not have no detriment on local services. A further £21 million was identified from ex existing, underspends, uh, existing identified underspends on employability programmes. And again, that was identified jointly between Scottish Government officials and um, directors of finance at local government. A further £30 million has been reprofiled on the Pupil Equity Fund, now, uh, the Local Government Attainment Grant, as it's now called. The, the funding for the Pupil Equity Fund goes straight to head teachers, and it's provided to head teachers on a financial year basis, although the teacher, head teachers spend that on an academic year basis. And therefore, sufficient councils have accrued £30 million that they will be holding back to the 24 25 to fund the schools and make sure that the schools get that funding. Now, the knock on consequence of that, of moving to an academic, to, from a, a financial year to an academic year funding, means that in 26 27 there will be a £30 million liability that would not otherwise have existed. And that, so that's been reprofiled forward from 26 27. And a further £7 million has been reprofiled from councils. Can, uh, existing to the redress scheme for survivors of historic child abuse. And again, that's simply a reprofiling. Councils have committed to giving £100 million to contribute to that redress scheme. They will now pay that £7 million over the same period, but on a different pay scale. So again, that's just reprofiled £7 million forward from later years into this year. And again, has no detriment to the scheme. And Scottish ministers will pick up that absence in the middle, uh, will pick up any shortfall in the middle. So in combination with those four factors, that has facilitated the £80 million, which has obviously been provided in a one-off because the 94 was already guaranteed for next year. And as I've hopefully outlined, none of those have any impact, any detrimental impact on existing services. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. And um, yeah, I really appreciate getting that detail because I think that uncertainty was, has been a big piece of 
of the puzzle and, and the desire for clarity. So it's really good to understand where the, the funding has come from um, through the underspend and reprofiling. So thanks for that. And now I'd like to bring in Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to uh, move on to ask a couple of questions with regards to what the workforce uh, looks like in local government, because our predecessor committee looked at work workforce planning back in 2018 and noted that local authority workforces tend not to reflect the communities they serve. So I wanted to ask um, what progress has been made to try to make um, our workforce more representative and specifically around senior positions within local government um, and any work both COSLA or Scottish Government have been doing on this. Um, so I'll maybe bring yourself and Councillor Hackman to start. Thank you. Um, so clearly we have various legal duties across local authorities to report back on, on basically what what our workforce looks like, and certainly as, as an elected member that sits on my scrutiny committee, I, I receive those reports annually, and certainly members will scrutinise those reports because absolutely we want to ensure that our workforce is reflective. Clearly, apprenticeships is, is one avenue that that local authorities will be using. And we have some fantastic local employability partnerships that work in conjunction with our local authorities as well to ensure that we can actually provide that certainty of employment for, for our local communities. But I think there's a huge amount of work that is done in terms of data gathering and that benchmarking. And certainly this absolutely is an ongoing, an ongoing issue. I think just from the last equalities report that I've received in my own in my own council I think it, I noted that we were we were hitting the minimum targets and I think my question to council officers is that's great that we're hitting the minimum but let's let's be more aspirational than just hit the bare minimum because actually we want to be leading we want to be a leading employer and clearly across Scotland local authority the workforce is absolutely going forward but I don't know if Simon has an awful lot more detail possibly than I do. I, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hagman. And I suppose I would just reflect that there's a, a range, a broad range of not only local activity but national activity uh, targeting diversity across not only, um, for example, the, the teaching workforce, the education workforce, but also all other parts of our workforce as well. One of the, the key challenges that there has long been with uh, diversity and uh, understanding what the makeup of our workforce is, is the fact that when it comes to our public sector equality duties, the responsibility on employers is only to ask the question. There is no legal duty on anybody, any one of us, uh, to, to disclose the information. And I think there's uh, been a long challenge that, uh, as local authorities, through uh, a range of the groups that we've got, such as the Scottish Council's Equality Network and through uh, our Society of Personal Development, uh, equalities, uh, working groups, etc., have been trying to uh, overcome how do we pose to, to people the importance and the value of sharing uh, your, uh, your, your diversity um, um, exam or information with, with an, uh, an organisation so that we can use it as effectively as possible in our workforce planning, so that we can understand where we are underrepresented, where we need to better reflect the communities that we serve. And I think there's a challenge there to um, assure people, not convince them, but assure people that the data will be used appropriately and accordingly, that it will look different across Scotland, and that when we do have that data, it will positively impact their work experience that they've got with us as employers. Okay. Thanks for that. Does anyone else want to, to add on what's been said there? Very, very, very briefly. And one of the <coughs> things that we need to do in, um, we, across a number of areas is, is make sure that we are um, showing just how desirable it is to work in local government, you know, and, 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 and how it is um, a, a rewarding in a number of a number of fields a rewarding career path to take and I think maybe we've lost that a little bit but I think there's a huge amount of effort going on um, between um, COSLA and, and a range of partners to, to make sure we're highlighting some of the careers where there are real opportunities for um, young people in particular um, to um, progress into those careers with a real opportunity and a, a sense of pride in what they're delivering for for uh, the wider society. Th thank you for that. And I think last week we heard, um, and it was mentioned around the Withers report, um, and what seems to still be a lack of connection between workforce planning within um, our college sector and local authorities, and, and what seems to have been a missed opportunity to look at different um, pathways for people um, into 
you know, different uh, jobs. And, and it leads me on to my, my next question with regards to reports which have been published, often highlighting that most local authority staff are women um, and inequalities around pay and progression within councils. Um, so looking at that, wondered what actions have been taken specifically around that issue um, and the gender pay gap. Do, do you think that's improving? And, and which councils aren't managing to make progress on that. I mean, bring you in again to start, Councillor Hackman. Yep. So, I mean, there's there's a range of work that is ongoing, clearly, and I know Simon has outlined some of that, and I'll maybe bring him in in a second. Um, the Improvement Service does a huge amount of work, and there is collaboration across local authorities as to best practice. You know, we have to have that sort of benchmarking data, and it's really important that we do. I think certainly reflecting back on my conversations, the roundtable conversations on child poverty, and certainly that that point that you raise about women and inequality and low wages is absolutely one that we are we are hearing loud and clear. And do you know I think maybe just to reflect back to the previous question, that's that's one of the reasons why the, the current pay offer is is heavily weighted to those on the lower end um, at the request of our trade union partners. But in terms of the specifics, I'll maybe bring Simon in. Thanks, sir. I, I suppose just uh, reflecting in terms of the, the gender pay gap, obviously councillors are continuously working to close that gap. And as Councillor Hagman has reflected, that's a key part of actually uh, our thinking when we are uh, going through negotiations with trade unions on annual kind of pay settlements. I think uh, clearly in terms of actually how do we attract and how do we offer a broader range of opportunities, actually offering a, a broad range of flexible working opportunities is a key part of what we can do for our communities and attract people to uh, the careers within Scottish local government. So, yet again, I think there's, there's something that we still all collectively need to do in terms of that challenge about the value of all of the types of roles that we offer, the diversity of the, the different types of contracts that you can have within local government, the opportunity that that provides individuals with, uh, and, and the more that we can do to demonstrate that there is value uh, from all of our colleagues uh, who work behind the scenes, uh, who, who do catering, cleaning, janitorial roles within schools uh, and with many other facilities that actually help uh, children and young people help our communities on a day-to-day -day basis as a kind of key part so that we don't continue to focus on only certain professions within the workforce. That's perhaps one of the things that's to all of our detriment is that we tend to spotlight key professions but we don't understand that actually they're all interrelated, they're all interconnected. They all, they all can only deliver the services that they do by working together. Thank you for that. And just in terms of um, future budgeting, um, do you know what currently is outstanding across local government around settling equal pay claims. Some councils have obviously uh, moved to do that, but just wondered what financial um, level we're talking uh, on around for authorities which haven't done that to date. So I don't have that specific information today, but it's something we can follow yeah. up with following the committee. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. Thanks, Miles. Yes, that, that would be uh, welcome. I'm now going to bring in Miles. No, I'm not going to bring in Miles. I'm going to bring in Mark Griffin. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kevina. Last year's spending review um, suggested that um, public sector workforces would have to shrink, um, including local authority workforces, in order to remain sustainable. Uh, Minister, can I ask if that is still the, the government's view? I think it still remains the government's view that we need to... Um, continue to make sure that with the limited resources we have across public service, we are applying them um, to, to achieve the, the best possible um, results for, for citizens. And, and we need to continue to look at ways of doing things more efficiently, more effectively um, uh, going forward. So that's part of the flexibilities that, in terms of for, for local government to making sure that they can do things differently, if appropriate. Um, so I, I guess that's that's where that sits. But but nonetheless, we have managed to provide additional funds to local government in, in recent years. And similarly, Councillor Hagman, with the government suggesting that the the workforce will have to reduce to remain sustainable, are you able to set out whether that is possible for local government to reduce um, workforce levels and still provide the the level of service that you are or are expected to? Yes. Yeah, so across local. Across local government, our, 
Our key services, they are transforming. You know, we're having to adapt. We're having to look at different ways to, to do things. Um, with my resources hat on, I do sit with a digital hat on. So by that very nature, there may be services that, provided, that may be provided in a different way in the future. However, it's really clear that in order to have that sort of proactive to, to sort of downstream funding is so is so important so our workforce will have to adapt but there may be areas where we're looking to expand our workforce and it has to be done on a on a local authority basis and that's where again I, I, I've repeatedly come back to the Verity House Agreement, but that is where it's so crucial to have those really honest dialogues. You know, there, there's areas in Scotland where there's depopulation and services have to be delivered in a different manner. There's other areas which are seeing a rise in population and therefore the, the demands on those services are really stretched. So we have to be adaptable, we have to be flight of foot. Where there is opportunity with shared services, that's something that we, were, we are actively taking part of. And certainly with my digital hat on, the, the shared platforms and the shared delivery is something that you know, I'm working through. And I, I sit again with government um, on, those, on those discussions because clearly we, we, need to, we need to do things in a different manner. But ultimately, ensuring our workforce is protected is a, is a key element. And we do acknowledge that we have an ageing workforce and we, we've, we've got real issues in terms of recruitment as well. So, you know, I, I can't say a, a definitive yes, this would be OK or no, that would not, because it is so nuanced across the plane. But what I would say is local government is standing ready to adapt and, and where possible we, we will, and ensuring that we're still delivering that real baseline for our communities. OK, and as service delivery um, changes, how are COSLA and um, local authorities assessing the impact on its workforce, particularly the impact that has on women and minority groups within its work workforce to make sure that it's not um, impacting negatively on them more than on other groups? And similarly, what assessment is carried out on the impact on um, women and minority groups and communities that rely on the services that are going to be um, delivered in a different way? Yes, so I mean, clearly, you know, we have our, our legal duties that we need to respond to, which I think was outlined by, by Simon. Um, we'll continue to do that. Obviously, we're, we're working within our community. So, we, you know, as a local councillor, you're hearing direct from that. But clearly, we need to have the data too. And that's where we need to work in partnership with colleagues right across. And I think the point was raised earlier. It's not just about local government. It's about all our public services to ensure that we've got that consistency going right through. Um, certainly, in, in my role as resources spokesperson, I've, I've reached out to the to the women's budgeting panel and looking at that wide range of, of issues. But in terms of any other specific... I'll maybe turn to Simon to see if there's any other points that I've missed in, in my summary there. I think, uh, Councillor Hagman, you, you make the key, the key point. Obviously, we've got legal duties, so all the time the decisions that councils are making are informed by equality and human rights impact assessment that they will do at a local level, which is understanding uh, what mitigating actions do they need to take or, or how do they eliminate any impact on our communities and on our workforce as well. And, uh, and I suppose that's the, the real kind of key uh, element of that, is that we not, need to not only look at the impact on our communities, but also on our workforce when we make the decisions uh, at budget time and and uh, throughout policy development at a local level. So that's a kind of critical part of what we do. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm now going to bring in Pam Gosal. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, just talking about the skills gaps here, uh, the skills shortages uh, in local authorities and that the Accounts Commission has noted that there's challenges in recruiting both at operational and uh, with leadership staff. When kind of talking about um, skill shortages, um, last week one of the panels spoke about how higher levels of economic inactivity play into the recruitment challenges, and councils are coming up with different innovative ways to engage uh, with the people out there for the workforce. But, but of course, um, education skills and employment are also the responsibility for the Scottish Government. So I wanted to ask, how are the Scottish Government supporting this drive? 
Can I ask the Minister, please? Yeah. Yeah, obviously, ultimately, the direct employment is a, is a matter for local authorities to, to, to shape their workforce, but, but clearly there will be um, areas where there's a Scottish-wide issue in terms of particularly in skills gaps, and so in those areas, um, which I, I guess should be coming to specifically uh, shortly, um, environment and health planning, um, building standards, you know, these, are, these are challenges that you will have, have heard, and, and it's absolutely appropriate in those circumstances. Um, that we work in collaboration with our colleagues and uh, our colleagues in local government, but also um, our colleagues in further and higher education um, um, and in the specific professions. So, um, obviously, the area that I'm most aware around is, is in terms of planning. So, in terms of planning, the uh, government and COSLA are working with the heads of planning, HOPs, um, and also um, RTPI to make sure that we're um, taking that forward, um, and there's a lot of work going on in these areas where particular skills gaps have been identified. Um, so I think the, you know, the first thing you need to do is to recognise there is a challenge that, and then work together to meet those challenges, and, and that is something that we are absolutely doing in collaboration with our local government uh, partners and, and others. Could I go back to the follow-up, please? Yep. Sure. Um, uh, thank you, um, Minister, for your response there. Um, just talking about earlier on, I noted that you spoke about, obviously, the future here, that it's very important to have early consultation with um, uh, local government in relation to new Scottish Government bills, legislation coming forward and Members' Bill. Obviously, we talk about that today, and we know that 700 planners are needed in the next five years, and Councillor Katie spoke about the challenges around that as well, with only one, I think, university having that um, uh, course offered there. So just talking about, we've got new legislations that have practically come out now here nearly every week, uh, you know, uh, like the short-term lets and other legislations we spoke about many times in this committee. But how do you see, um, Minister, um, a question for yourself, that um, obviously discussions are happening now for the future, but what about current legislations like this, that we know there's shortages and we know there's a huge demand on planning and building standards? How are, we, how are you looking to tackle the demands that are coming up now then? So obviously you're conflating two very different points. So there is a, a line in the sand in terms of um, how we operate and, and Verity House Agreement drew that line in the sand um, in terms of how we collaborate forward. If, if you want to talk about the, the planning issues in terms of what we're doing, then I've, you know this is absolutely a real a real issue which has been um, identified by local government, Scottish government, um, heads of planning, RTPI have all recognised uh, the challenges here. The challenges are, are not just straightforward. It's not just that folk are leaving um, planning. It's 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 more than that. It's the challenges around recruitment. It's uh, the challenges of um, having a new planning regime which is transformational for Scotland and we want to make sure we get the most from it. Um, so it creates all of these opportunities. So that's why um, we have been for some time working with our partners to, to look at how we can address that. I think, I'm, I'm not sure I recognise the, the number that, that you gave us. I think that's um, a higher number than I'd heard. But nonetheless, it's, there is for sure a substantial number of new planners will be required over the next um, 10 to 15 years. So we need to plan for that, and, and we are doing so. Um, uh, one of the, the really important pieces of work that we took forward was the, the Future Planners Report. So the Scottish Government um, provided some funding to assist with the Heads of Planning and the Royal Town Planning Institute to, to look at how we can tackle some of these challenges. And that report is a really useful. It was published um, in 2022. You will no doubt, it. I'm sure the committee is well aware of it. And we're taking forward the actions in that report. There's nothing in that report that's, that, that is unachievable. Um, there's a number of short-term actions, medium-term actions, and long-term actions. And we're making real progress, um, particularly on right in the right here and now, on the, on the, the short-term actions. Um, but we'll, we'll continue working with our, our partners to, to do more because these are potentially real challenges coming forward. And, and um, I think one, one of, one of the, the, the issues you mentioned was around. Um, opportunities for undergraduate um, courses. So there is an undergraduate course in um, my home city in, in the Duncan and Jordanson College of Art in, in Dundee University, um, which does an undergraduate courses, but other undergraduate courses have have stopped operating. And partly that's because often people who end up becoming planners um, don't, that's not their, their initial aim. They, they start off doing something else, whether it's architecture and then doing master's courses. And there are a number of master's courses um, across the country. So one thing that we're doing this year was to, to support that shift. So we've funded 10 
RTPI bursaries um, for students undertaking that post postgraduate planning degrees um, in Scottish planning this year. Um, we'll obviously see how that goes and see whether that's something we, we can expand to encourage more folk to, to make that shift. But I, I actually think one of the big things we need to do is to, to collectively help um, when, when folk are particularly at school, looking at their, their career choices, make sure they realise just how exciting planning is. Um, because often folk go through another course and then realise, oh, it's actually a planner I want to be. Um, and then they have to do a, a further course. Um, and so I've, I've certainly been engaging with the, the young planners who are a really enthusiastic group of folk um, and really keen to um, help make sure that the, the wider um, potential employment um, pool understands exactly what planning does and how exciting it is, particularly in the context of NTF4 and the transition to net zero. This is you know, um, something that I, I think if, if we can get that message across, then, then more colleges and universities will consider doing an undergraduate course. I'm not sure if I can name them just now, but I am aware of at least one other university considering uh, uh, starting a, an undergraduate course, which will be good if that happens. But we need to, to do more to encourage um, what more we can do. So one of the things we're keen to look at is whether there's an opportunity for work-based work training so that, that, that um, young folk can do their undergraduate course while working for, say, a local authority. And a number of local authorities are keen on, on helping um, with, with that process, but you know, you know, we need to work out and make sure it's going to work for the universities, but also for the young people and um, our local authorities. One of the challenges we've got is that NTF4 does provide um, a huge number of opportunities, so there's an increased um, a draw from the private sector as well that we have to. So we do need to make sure that we're increasing that pool, but we're absolutely working together on that um, with not just with local government, but with also with the, uh, the other partners. No, thank you, Minister. It's great to hear that you've got some great work happening in the future, which I'll look forward to see. But what are we going to do about the, the challenges in recruitment right this minute? Because the fact that we've got so many legislations going in, and members' bills as well, going through, um, how are we going to help, basically, local government at this moment, the challenges? What kind of talks are you having there? And what, how can we help with so, that? With so the I'm, new... I'm not sure. I, again, I think we're... Can I, are we talking about planning? Or are we talking about wider no, government? No, planning, because... Um, so, uh, obviously that's fine. Later, yeah. good, good. so if we're talking about planning, then you know the changes we're making, we're making right now. Um, so the, the bursaries are there. We're working with heads of planning also to, to look at you know, what further we can all do to make the planning system more efficient. So one of the things that you'll be aware of coming through is the um, permitted development rights. You know, if we, we get that right, so um, then that potentially takes pressure off of our um, local government planners in terms of the work they do. We need to get it right, though, because obviously we, we don't want to just say everything's OK. It's a, it's a free-for-all, so there needs to be appropriate planning support. So that's why we're consulting on that. That's why we'll, we'll be bringing further legislation forward. Um, and, you know, I'm absolutely open to suggestions on what further work we can do. One of the other pieces of work that we're, um, we're working on, it, it's not right now, but the digitisation of some of that, um, I think, potentially offers huge advantages in the future. And we also, we can already see a number of local authorities digitising some of the work that they're doing, making, moving to more online, less, than, less, less paper, um, much more efficient. But I think it's important to remember that this doesn't all rest on um, the local authority planners. A huge amount of weight goes on to local authority planners and sometimes um, a, a, f a fair amount of unfair criticism um, when things don't go the way um, some applicants would like. There's a responsibility for applicants as well to make sure that when they submit an application that it's submitted with the required um, information which then helps the planning authority make its decision um, as speedily as possible. Clearly, sometimes folk are not going to like the decisions that come out of, of a planning process, and that's um, why there is uh, appeals. But um, from speaking to developers, one of the things that they're keen is that it's, it's the time. So if you're going to be told no, then let, let me know it's no sooner. And I think part of, part of that is on um, the applicants to make sure that their applications are as right as possible. And that's one of the things, again, that we're working with um, uh, local authority partners, um, heads of planning, um, to, to try and understand what more we can do to help um, with that process. Richard, I do have a follow-up on a carers, but I'll wait till you to say that I've got any well, more time. Well, I think we need, to, yeah, yeah. we need to move on. Um, I'm going to now bring in Ivan McKee.
Yeah, thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, morning. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, one point, circling back on the general power of competence that, uh, that Ian mentioned. Um, and I suppose I'm just thinking, looking at that and thinking, well, if this is something that UK government has power to do, and they've done that for local authorities in England, um, but we're in this strange position where the Scottish government doesn't have the authority to give that power to local authorities in Scotland as a consequence of your reading of the devolution settlement. Um, so first, to clarify, is that where we are? I think that's a kind of strange position to be in. Um, but then do you see value in the general power of competence? Is it giving English local authorities the ability to make progress that Scottish local authorities can't do? And is there value in us having that power in Scotland? And if so, is it something that there should be conversations with the UK government about? And I suppose that's a question for the Minister as well. Yeah, sorry. No, I, if I may, I mean, I'll just say absolutely there is value in that from a local government point of view. Obviously, the legislation with Scottish government and UK government needs to... It's a conversation that, obviously, I'll, I'll sit, sit to one side. But, no, I think there's, there's absolutely a desire from local government that this is pursued. So I think that's okay. just my simple Thank response you. from me. So, so, I mean, I think whatever the constitutional situation is, I think we should step back and what is it we're trying to achieve and if we can achieve that without changing um, and going down what would almost certainly be a, a challenging um, constitutional battle line, then we should try and do that because local authorities are wanting these additional powers sooner. So that, that, that's why my message to leaders across Scotland has been, you know, if you've got ideas, then let's, let's, let's test them out and let's see what... And if the challenge is this, is that this can't be resolved without that power, then I think we need to look at it. But I don't think I've seen anything where that would be the case. I don't know if Ian's aware of anything where that would be the case. If there is, we need to look at it. But if we're looking at whether you know there's one magic power that makes everything OK, then looking down south, that wouldn't appear to be the answer. You know, We've got 26 councils in, in some of England's most deprived areas at risk of effective bankruptcy. Now we've, we've seen um, Birmingham, we've seen Slough, Croydon, Woking, um, so clearly there's something not right there, um, and, and you know if there's lessons to be learned, then then great. But I'm um, I'm not sure there's any one you know sweeping power that has um, the, the the ability to to, to um, resolve some of these challenges. Um, I think the, the the secret for us is to make sure that we're working in collaboration and with respect, and I think that really gives us the opportunity to make a difference on the ground in shorter time than what potentially would be a constitutional yeah, battle. I get all of that. Um, you don't want um, better to be the any of best. If there are things that we can do, we should absolutely go and do them, of course, on a specific yeah. basis. Um, and, of course, if there are problems with local authorities in England, that can be due to a whole range of reasons, but I don't think it's necessarily... It might not necessarily be due to that power. But I suppose the question still stands in principle. Does the Scottish Government everything else being equal, think that there's value in having that power? Because it certainly seems from what Councillor Hagman is saying, that local government would be very happy to have that power alongside everything else that they're looking for. I, I mean, I, I'm happy to come in. Yes, that is absolutely something that local government is looking for. But in the interim, at this point, I think it was referenced previously, one of the points that Cosla was very keen, and certainly I was very keen, is that actually we co-chair the working group um, initially, there was a, a bit of a discussion whether that was going to be a co-chaired model, and we agreed that, yes, this is a, a, a working group of equals. So there is that ability to bring forward within that forum. Um, obviously, it sits with, with ministers and, and uh, ministers. We've got Tom Arthur, Patrick Harvey and Joe Fitzpatrick, who, who all sit on there. So, you know, there's a real opportunity right now and as we say, if there's, op if there's a desire to, ex to explore new and innovative ways yeah. of local government revenue raising, we do have a vehicle to, to do that. OK, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Right, um, so that the person I was going to raise was um, around about staffing numbers. And first of all, um, you'll have heard the evidence we've taken and there was a bit of kind of... Um, turn and fro around what the numbers were, because the Scottish Government numbers as published would indicate that there had been um, quite reasonable increases in local authority staffing levels. Um, and the retort to that, of course, was that, yeah, but there was some extra workload there, 
that we require an extra staff and also um, there have been some reclassifications there around about alloys and so on. So I suppose if the, the, the question is, is, uh, is there an agreed set of numbers taking all of this into account or is there a desire to work together to publish an agreed set of numbers that means everybody can kind of look at this thing on a level playing field basis? Because at the moment you can understand it's very confusing when people are telling us there's been staff cuts but the numbers are shown the opposite. I mean, I can come in as, as a starter on that one. There's, there's not an agreed number as such, and I think that would be an almost impossible task just to reflect the, the nuances and, and the differences across local authorities. Clearly, there are some areas where we, you know, we've got plenty of staff and we're delivering. There's, there is shortages of staff. Obviously, we've, we've touched upon planning, but you know, we have shortages of social workers and quantity surveyors, environmental health officers, um, specific teaching staff as well. So you know, we, we have to be clever on this one. I think we have to also acknowledge that we're working on the backdrop where there has been years of austerity and there's the impact of Brexit and there is also the real impact of the pandemic and where we're at and that has changed the working patterns. Obviously we want to be we want to support our workforce as best as possible and we do have to have that degree of flexibility. So certainly from a local government point of view, these are these are all parts of the mosaic that we're pulling together for that bigger picture. Um, well, yes and no. I mean, Brexit impacts recruitment, but it doesn't impact what the actual number is. Um, if there are shortages, absolutely. But again, that's a separate issue. It's an important issue, but it's a separate issue to whether the numbers are actually increasing or decreasing as we speak. Um, in a pandemic, yeah, it's been and it's gone, and yeah, there might be some spillover from that, but we'll isolate that. So I think those are all issues, but frankly, I don't think they're relevant issues to understanding whether we can agree on whether the numbers are going up or down. No, I Appreciate that, and yeah. I think the, the point of, of our digital transformation, and again, going back to planning, um, there's there's work being looked at in terms of e-portals, etc., and how we're delivering in a different manner that actually meets the needs of our community. And we we do have to have those sometimes difficult conversations. I know certainly, again, reflecting on my own local authority, there's some areas where perhaps our third sector partners are delivering where initially or previously council would have been delivered so it's about having those really honest and and equally where you've got enterprise agencies and other other parts of the sector <laughs> delivering we need to have a real understanding of, of where the responsibilities lie with a focus on what is it that what are our outcomes what are we trying to achieve right. so just to wrap that up then we're effectively in a position where we're going to have to agree that we are not in a position to be able to say what the number is, whether it's going up or down, and we're not in a position to be able to get to that position at any point in the future. That's kind of where we're at, is it? No, no, the statistics oh, right, okay. are, are published. And so the, the latest okay. statistics were published on the 12th of September, which for local government shows over the last year roughly a, a, a very slight increase, mm -hmm. a very slight increase. And some of that might be because of some of the additional things that local government are doing, early learning provision, for instance. So you would expect to see an increase. Right. But, but yeah. I, what we're hearing is on a like-for-like -like basis. There's alleyways in and out of that. There's extra responsibilities in and so out of that. The, the, the so on a like-for-like -like basis, yeah. we're not in a position to be able to say whether the numbers go up, down, or staying the, the same. So, so the st statistics across um, local government are, I'm sorry, across public services are published, and maybe that is something that it would be useful to be shared with the committee. Yeah, and I've seen those, those numbers. That's on the 12th of September, which covers NHS, for instance, where there's a significant increase, as we'd expect. Devolved civil service, where there's a slight decrease. Um, the figure for local government is a, a very slight increase, but you okay. know, pretty flat. Um, so, so government's position is so, that local authority number is increasing. So when people say there's been cuts and there's less people in local authorities, that's not correct. That, so that, both, both things can be true because, uh, as I think Councillor Hagman <laughs> indicated, that there will be the experience of individuals in some areas where if there's been a, a, a shift of, you know, whether it's because of difficulties in terms of recruiting because of Brexit or because of a shift of the way working is done, it, it can very well feel like there's a cut in some of these particular areas because there's a reduction in staff in that particular area. Um, the figures that are published clearly are, are overall yeah. figures, and, and I, I think that's appropriate. But it, the experience on the ground 
for someone who's in an area where there's been a shift of people away might be that there's a reduction. So I don't think anybody's coming, coming to you um, with untruths. It's just that they're expressing what they're seeing on the ground, which, as Councillor Hagman has said, might, might vary. Well, feeling is one thing, but the numbers are like an up or down, and it's staying the so same. The right, numbers are and slightly it's up. up. Right. Okay. So when people say there's less people, that's not correct. Simon. Okay. I suppose, from, from a cause of perspective. In terms of when you look at the, the tracking over the figures in the rest, there was a reduction of 32,000 full-time equivalents across the period of 2009 to 2016. And whilst there has been a slight increase, our figures actually remain at 2011 uh, levels uh, when they, where they fell dramatically. Uh, I know I just provided that, that right. clarity on where I know the numbers are, the numbers say they're going up, yeah. but nobody can agree whether that means the numbers are going up or they're not going up, and that's the problem. So you can understand how it's really difficult to make any sense of this, and people keep talking about things that happened 10 and 15 years ago, which frankly is quite unhelpful in regards to where we are today. Mm. Moving on from that, um, the, I wanted to explore a wee bit about what works ongoing to try and look for opportunities to do things more efficiently. So, obviously, Councillor Hagman, we talked about digital and automation of processes. Um, there's clearly um, work that's been referenced before around about different local authorities collaborating on shared services. Um, there will be other areas where third sector perhaps is, is, is more capable than local government are picking up specific uh, activities, etc., etc., etc. So, really, just wanted to um, draw out some specific examples you can maybe share where there's been good practice there, quantify how much it's saved compared to the counterfactual, and then what work is ongoing to, uh, to drive more improvements in that regard, and what impact you could see that having on help to tackle the uh, recruitment challenges. So I'm, I'm happy to come in on specific examples. I think across the education collaboratives, that's a really positive piece of work. And looking at that, yes, there will be savings in so far that where you have, say, for example, a hire or an advanced hire that's been delivered online across two different or three different local authorities, yes, you will have a savings of a teacher, but actually where we've not been able to recruit we're actually ensuring that there's opportunities for our young people. And, you know, I, I can write down to my own ward level, there's young people in my, in my town who are able to do advanced higher subjects, which without that collaboration with, through the education collaboratives that have been set up, they just simply wouldn't have that opportunity. In terms of putting a direct spend or a direct cost on that, that's, you know, we can certainly look and we can see if we can provide you with, with some level of that detail. Um, but it's not just about that finite cost. And obviously, we have to be really mindful of all our budgets, but we have to be able to provide for our young people and for our communities and wider shared services. The, the Education Collaborative is one. Obviously, we've got shared services across planning within local authorities and building control, etc. That's another example that's already in situ. We've also got, which was referenced again at one of the roundtable discussions, where you've got social work working within schools to ensure that actually we're looking at that outcome. Now, there may may be savings if you're using the same facilities, etc., and you're sharing services across departments as well as across authorities. But it is it has to be taken in that wider context. But in terms of the specific details, we can certainly take a note and, and try and come back with with the finite costs on that. Um, that's thanks for that. I suppose given this is probably the number one challenge you face in terms of I mean, resources, you've already said there can never be too much money. Um, being able to do things more efficiently, clearly, and we all recognise that there's plenty of scope for that because the technology is evolving, the scope for cooperation, as you've identified, between local authorities and the wider public sector and elsewhere. We've not even talked about states or any of the scope that there exists there as well. I suppose I'm slightly concerned that you're not able to quantify any of that, given it's the biggest challenge you've got. As I say, we can come back with that level of detail. I don't know, Simon, is there anything you want to... Yeah. Right, so there's nobody with that kind of running track or if this is how much we've saved this year through the good work we've done. I don't have it with me today, but, but we, okay. we will have that information. Is that something that government works with local authority on? and you got a perspective on that? Um, ultimately, 
government will work with COSLA on any of these areas. Um, you know, collaboration, I think, is, is key, um, and clearly we have a shared um, desire to, to, to make the progress. Um, obviously, in the wider public service, we need to, to look at where we can use technology better, we can do things differently. Um, there's obviously work ongoing in terms of the, the wider public um, service reform, um, and led, led by others. Um, but I think that the, the key is for us to work collaboratively. OK, thank you. Thanks. Right, thanks very much. And um, we welcome that detail coming forward um, another time. I'd like to bring Mark Griffin in for a brief supplementary. Thank, thanks, Kavina. Just briefly to ask the, the Minister or Councillor Hagman whether to help us understand the workforce numbers issue, whether there is any uh, more detailed breakdown um, by department on headcount at local authority level to help us understand perhaps movements between the departments and get a better understanding of uh, workforce issues within local government. I'll, I'll defer to Simon on this one, yeah. There are regular um, figures produced by every individual council with regards to their own work, kind of uh, workforce. So they've got uh, um, monthly workforce or, or quarterly workforce uh, monitoring uh, figures that are produced on their on their websites. There is actively work ongoing with colleagues within the improvement service to look at a data dashboard. Obviously, we used a data dashboard during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, and so that is work that is ongoing at the moment that can help hopefully get us to a position where by councils can use that platform and we can have more real-time data. I suppose one of the significant challenges, and I understand the points being made about the data that we've got, obviously it only gives you a, a moment in time, uh, so trying to find the data uh, that is live and can, and, and can um, clearly give us a picture on what is happening on the ground in the rest is something that we're actively working on uh, across local government at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, and that sounds like a very constructive piece of work that you're, you're working on with the Improvement Service. I'd like to bring in Willie Coffey. Again, convener, I wonder if I could just raise a couple of questions uh, um, with you, one on absence rates, if I can, probably with Katie, and maybe on the ageing workforce issue that was covered last week to um, Councillor Hagman. We were hearing last week that absence rates, particularly in the non-teaching staff area that we've been talking about earlier, have had significantly increased in the, the, the recent data set that we have. Is there any work going on in COSLA to understand what's going on there? what the reasons for that are, is it long COVID issues, is it general health issues, is it stress related? How do you gather and collect that information? And probably more importantly, what are you able to do about it? I mean, if you can't help us with the detail of that now, I'd certainly appreciate and sure the committee would any follow up information you may have to help us understand that. Thank you for that. I think, yeah, it is it's really pertinent. And again, certainly on a local level, people will be looking at this data and obviously going forward with, with significant pieces of work nationally, we are collating that data. And again, I'll maybe bring Simon in on, on the sort of nuances of that, because it is important information. And, you know, as I sort of said at the earlier point of the committee, Ensuring our workforce is supported, ensuring that they have good mental health, ensuring that you know they feel supported in their roles, and you know it is absolutely vital. You know, as a local authority, as the employers, we have a duty to look after all our staff across across Scotland, across all our communities. But in terms of the specific detail, I'll, I'll turn to Simon. Thanks very much, Councillor Hagman. And I suppose just really just to kind of confirm, during yet again the, the, the reflection of the, the COVID pandemic and the, the work that was uh, established during that period to work across um, all parts of the public sector with colleagues in health and so forth to, to have a very clear focus on mental health and wellbeing, that work continues very much uh, across a range of advisory groups and uh, networks uh, across all, all public sector partners. That activity is making sure that there is access to the, the appropriate supports uh, that can can uh, assist individuals. Uh, obviously, what we need to do collectively across the public sector is make sure they're, they're, they're available either on, on platforms or on a consistent basis in, in all parts of the country. Clearly, where you're in a remote and rural area, uh, where there are indeed the pressures of, uh, of staffing, etc., and the rest, the, the pressures will be different in different places. So, yet again, going back to some of the work around data dashboard and understanding where those pressures are coming from uh, in a, in a real-time basis is going to be a critical part to how we, we continue 
continue to respond. I think fundamentally, though, it comes back to one of those kind of key parts of the opportunity through Verity House, but also through public service form and local governance review is what are the pressures that there are on uh, staff across the piece because of the very many different policies and strategies that exist. How can we better streamline those, coordinate those and connect those so that individuals are better able to uh, focus on uh, delivering the, the, the or doing the roles that they're employed to do as opposed to monitoring or reporting the work that, they, that they're supposed to do. Mm. Is the picture changing though, Simon, the government in the last couple of years, two, three years of COVID, has the picture of absence changed significantly in any way? Or is there any particular reason you can pin this down to? I think it, it would be wrong to say that the picture hasn't changed and clearly because of the, uh, the the COVID experience and I think just probably just a general kind of uh, point in terms of people and their own kind of uh, health and well-being and, and yet again concerns there may be in terms of uh, the continued, I suppose, global pandemic that we, that we all live within in the rest and any kind of transfers that there might be. Uh, so that, that uh, continues to be a part of it. I think that's why the work that we've got to look at, well, how can we adapt and change the types of contracts and ways in which people are working to better enable them to do to do their jobs and give them that opportunity to uh, get the better uh, work-life balance is essential. So it continues to be that part. Thank you very much for that. Just and on the the issue about the ageing workforce, probably again more for for Katie, but I'd appreciate any comments from from Joe as well. We were hearing last week, of course, that we've got an an ageing workforce in local government, but we're also getting earlier retirals. And I was certainly asking why can we, how can we have both at the same time? But it was a perfectly good explanation given from colleagues last week about why that that happens. Um, do we accept and understand that? Uh, what are we trying to do to address that? And I was looking at the, the, the Withers recommendations on skills, the whole skills delivery landscape. Is that some an area where we can deploy some of the recommendations in that report to help us? Because if the ageing profile within local government continues to drift upwards, we probably need to start thinking about what we do about that at the, early, the sharper end, the earlier end, the apprentice end, new starts, that type of recruitment and skills development, I suppose, that, that, that Willers was talking about. So I'd invite you, Katie, to just say a few words about that and perhaps also invite Joe for his perspective too. Yeah, so, I mean, clearly across local government, yeah, you have, you have got an ageing workforce. We also really acknowledge that there may be some staff across our across a whole host of our our departments, etc., that are looking for retirement and that they are looking to take early retirement. And we we do need to sort of reprofile some of our workforce. We're constantly aware of of what that looks like and how it can best deliver. We we're also very aware that where redeployment is perhaps an opportunity that we need to support our workforce through that. And redeployment may not be the option that everybody wants to to go for. There, there may be a, a real desire to say, actually, I would like, and there should always be that opportunity. So you know, there's a real emphasis to ensure that all levels of our staff are supported. Clearly, you know, I think it was touched upon, and I think I mentioned it previously, about our local employability partnerships, you know, working with DWP, working with our colleges, working with our third sector. We want to ensure that we can, you, we can bring that new cohort and actually support them through a career in local government and that this is a career option available to them. Um, so I think it is important that we keep a watching eye on this and on this and again coming back to that monitoring and that benchmarking across Scotland from a local authority level it's crucial that we we follow and see where the data is and how best we can support our communities. Mm, thanks for that Katie. Uh, Minister any yeah, view so on that? I think Councillor Hagman has covered um, most of the points uh, eloquently. I, I think we can't overemphasise though the need to ensure we have um, a workforce with the correct skills and apprenticeships, I think, is really part of that. I think the Withers report is really helpful, actually, in term, term, telling us, help, helping us how we, we navigate that going forward across the public service, not just local authorities. So um, I think um, Councillor Hagman covered the points. Okay. Many thanks for that. Thank you. Convener. Thanks very much, Willie. I'm now going to bring in Marie McNair. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister and Councillor Hagman. Um, most of the kind of comments I was going to make on workforce planning have been covered. 
but the, the, the pan, pandemic's uh, just been touched on, and with that has brought significant changes for the workforce, from the shift to remote and hybrid working, uh, to significant increased demands on the local government services. I wanted to ask, uh, how has this impacted on staff wellbeing, and are there any particular groups that may have been disproportionately impacted? Yes, so I mean clearly this is a this is a huge issue for local mm -hmm. authorities and we will get response our we will get our reports back at a local authority level. We have to be mindful that there is an impact mm -hmm. absolutely on our staff and we have to be able to support where there is the options for remote and hybrid working. We also have to be realistic that actually sometimes that remote working is not always possible. And then on an individual basis, obviously challenging conversations have to be taken. But you know, obviously we will we will work with our entire workforce and we have to be mindful that the environment is tough for some, but we do need to have robust processes in place. There's work going nationally, and I think Simon referred to the fact that we need that level of consistency throughout the country, because there's not always that, that ability to get the support maybe necessarily right where we would want it, so where that's not available, what mitigation can we do? But there's a, there's a huge onus on our heads of HR and on our, our senior leadership team to be supporting you know all levels of their teams going forward and ultimately we need to have an environment where everybody is feeling feeling valued because it is so as, as i said our workforce is on the front line of our communities in so many different places and we have to make sure that we look after our staff because without without our staff local government literally is would be nothing you know we we need that Thanks for that. Can you do? Oh, thanks very much. I just wanted to actually pick up on that. Um, the, the piece about um, creating an environment where everyone feels valued. And then we've also been using the word efficiency. And I think there's something there. There's a bit of a tension around when we need to move to efficiencies and uh, make a, a, you know, create a service in a more efficient way. I, some of the things that I pick up from talking to um, local government's workforce it, is that sometimes that efficiency goes counter to really feeling that they can do the job in the way that they need to be doing it. And I think it's it's that bit about people-centered services. And when we move to too much efficiency in a people-centered service, they don't they don't quite match up. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I, I think if if I may, I think this is where having that that strategic leadership within our local authorities. And it comes back to some of perhaps the issues of recruitment and why we need to ensure that it is, you know, we, we acknowledge all aspects of our workforce and often our, our managers and our senior leaderships are having to have really challenging conversations in developing the workforce to ensure the workforce is, goes, you know, goes forward with that need, but while still ensuring that we're the well-being of our workforce. So it is, it's a challenging question and it's one that elected members sit with because clearly we, we are responsible to our communities as well. I think, as I say, having those clear lines of communication with our staff is crucial. We need to, we work collectively well, we work collectively through COSLA, but we also work individually with our trade union colleagues, and there's regular updates across the workforce to ensure that there is that dialogue, and that's good practice, and, and I know across local authorities that's happening. I'll maybe turn to Simon just to maybe confirm some of those local arrangements of, of where we are working and having those dialogues with our workforce to ensure that everybody is feeling not only heard, but actually listened to, because there is a difference between hearing something and actually listening to it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose just reflect absolutely, you know, colleagues on the ground are, are, are continuously engaging with, with uh, staff to understand uh, how they're feeling, what support they can be provided and, uh, and, and more. I suppose one kind of key point, and yet again reflecting back into Verity House and, and, you know, the opportunity that's in front of us, 
the pandemic, if nothing, demonstrated that when change is needed, we can change. And one of the things that I think we've long struggled with, and we've long spoken about it through Christie and, and, and previous reports, even back to the Macintosh report um, uh, at, the, at the establishment of the, the Parliament, about the relationships and the way in which we work. We need to articulate to uh, those who we want to come into local government and into public sector in general, but those who are within local government, that whilst change will happen and change is required, they will still have work. It's not what they do that will change, it's how they do it that will change. The, the roles that we've all got, we, we absolutely can see are innately uh, vital to our communities and, 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 and important. We need to be able to work together across government and local government and the wider public sector to better articulate what it means to be in public service, what those roles and those jobs will look like and what the career opportunities that there will be. We no longer live uh, in a in a world where a career is any one thing. A career is now made up of many different opportunities. Uh, and we need to articulate to children and young people that there's many ways into careers and there are many opportunities once you get into organisations and what's in front of you. So I think out of Verity House, out of uh, the discussions we're having uh, with our professional advisors through local governance, through public service reform and that person-centred approach, that's the, the key challenge for us to articulate to uh, people across Scotland. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Simon. That, that's really helpful. There's another thing that I would like to pick up on as well. Um, so it, I think it is related to workforce planning in a way, workforce, yeah, workforce in, um, I think maybe Simon, you said earlier, it's not, or maybe I've got it mixed up, but it's not uh, what we do, it's how we do it. And I think one of the things that I've become really aware of in this committee is the number of plans that council has to come forward with because of, and to go back to earlier part of our conversation, um, the number of bills that come through and we talked about members' bills and amendments and often a bill has a requirement for a plan and uh, and it seems to me that that's something that I think it has come up here at the committee before that there's a, a level of onerousness in the plans and what I'm also beginning to notice is wondering around a coherence across various bits of legislation in terms of those plans. And I just wondered if that is something that is, I know it's early days, but I just wondered if that's something that's um, being discussed under the um, uh, the agreement, the uh, and in particular in your agreed shared program of activity. Is that something that you're looking at, kind of creating that coherence potentially? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it certainly is. And, you know, one of the points is about, you know, the, the data gathering. And, you know, there's a lot of emphasis that has been put on that. I think it is referred to sometimes as that, that bur burdensome data gathering that's put on local authorities when, you know, we're so focused on collecting the data that we get lose sight of what it is that we're actually trying mm -hmm. to achieve. Um, so streamlining that and actually working with Scottish Government, again, focusing on those outcomes. But a lot of this does come down to trust. And I think Joe referred to this in his opening remarks. It's about recognising that local government has a key responsibility. You know, I, I'm sitting here with, with my mandate, my democratic mandate that is as equal to anybody's democratic mandate you know there's not levels of democratic mandates we are all equal and i think there's a real opportunity to recognize that and work in collaboration to actually have that level of respect both ways between mm. local government and scottish government yep i, th I think it's a, a really good question um when we speak to um, local government finance colleagues, then they will often um, highlight the fact that while there's all this ring fencing, there's all this other bureaucracy that they have to, which is challenging, which takes resource. Um, and as Council Hagman said, we need to make sure that that reporting is supporting us in reaching to the outcome. So it's really helpful that Verity House, we've, we've got some agreed outcomes and actually shifting, I think um, Simon mentioned, um, Christy, you know, Christy was, how many years ago was that? That was a long time ago, I think. Um, Mark Griffin and I sat on the finance committee at the time it was, it was going through and we were, it, this was going to help us shift to an outcomes-based um, preventative. It's really, really difficult to do. And, and so hopefully Verity House helps us with that by focusing rigidly on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So making sure that everything we're doing um, supports us in achieving those outcomes. It's, it's not unusual for 
legislation to come through this, this Parliament, and then at stage three, there's an amendment comes in which puts another reporting responsibility, and very often, ultimately, that reporting lands on local government because they're um, the folk who are um, delivering the service on, on the ground. Um, so I, I guess that's why I think we all need to think how we... we um, do those things a little bit differently. I absolutely understand why um, members of parliament want to, to see how money is being spent, want to see what the out, outputs are, but surely our focus has to be on what those outcomes are. So in terms of education, how are we making you know young folk, giving them the, the, the better opportunities for the future? Um, in terms of poverty, driving poverty down, um, particularly for, for young people, these are, are um, objectives that um, are agreed as priorities across the political um, and public uh, service spectrum. So I think we need to, to work harder to focus on those outcomes. We have been trying to do it for a number of years. Hopefully Verity House helps us in that path. Yeah, that, that's good to hear. And I think I think what, something that's coming up for me there is that it, it, I think we would welcome to you know, hear what you, where you get to in that conversation. And I think at some point, certainly the parliament needs to be involved in that. If there's amendments coming from members, um, there needs to be a greater understanding of, of, as you say, those impacts. So maybe there's something, there's at some point a, a moment where parliament does need to get involved as well um, and to have that education, that understanding of impacts on, on amendments. I think, if, if I may, I mean, certainly, because the leaders meet regularly, um, and certainly where there are amendments and opportunities to feed in, then leaders will take take that opportunity. We also have the opportunity to have that early dialogue um, with Scottish Government, and certainly through our thematic boards at COSLA, we will look and have dialogue and discussions. They won't necessarily be making decisions, because that will be for the 32 local authority leaders to decide going forward. But I think absolutely there is an opportunity that certainly Verity House allows local government to, to have that early dialogue and that continued dialogue as well. It's good to know that those mechanisms are in place, those communication um, forums. Yeah. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our um, session this morning and I really appreciate you coming today. I think it's been very useful and I think I've actually been just sitting here feeling um, a great sense of delight actually to have both the Scottish Government and COSLA represented in this conversation and that's that fruition of the new deal with local government and it's, it's good to hear that it's being very positive and constructive so far. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. We now turn to agenda item three, which is consideration of the Valuation Proposals Procedure Scotland Amendment Regulations 2023. There is no requirement for the committee to make any recommendations on negative instruments. Do members have any comments on the instrument? No, no comment. Um, is the committee agreed that we do not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? We are agreed. Thank you. We agreed at the last part, at the, at the start of the meeting, to take the next item in private. So as that was the last public item on our agenda for today, I now close the public part of the meeting.